Okay, we're in Unit 4. We're going to be talking about federalism, which again is the just a study of the separation of the states and central government and how those two interact to provide um, government for the United States. <clears throat> so <clears throat> it's really more, little more than a way of organizing a government. And so you have different levels of government. If you can think about it, we have many levels. So you have um, you know, city governments, county governments. And so if you want to build a new big shed and you live in the city, um, you often have to go get a city building permit before you um, build that shed. Um, in the county, <clears throat> there's certain zoning ordinances, so you can't just build a business in the middle of nowhere. If you want to, it's got to be zoned correctly. Um, and so if you try to, again, build a, build a business in a residentially zoned area of a city, um, you wouldn't be allowed to build there. There would be county zoning on top of the city zoning. If you go talk to the city zoning or county, um, that's just at the kind of the basis level. And then you go up, you have the state government as well. And then beyond the state government, you have the federal government. Okay. Um, so federalism is a way of uh, you have multiple levels of government over the same area um, that can um, impact you. So states have power, federal governments have power, local governments have power, and again, this is part of Madison's design. If you separate power and under all these different uh, levels of government, the idea would be is that it's very difficult to have one faction control all of the government. So, for instance, um, because there's been a lot of gridlock in states or in, uh, certainly in the national and the federal government, there's been a very closely divided party situation where, um, you know, the Democrats control the White House, the Republicans control Congress, um, <clears throat> so it's hard to get anything done federally. Well, a lot of the policy um, experiments and, and developments have been taking place either at a state level or at the city level. Um, and cities are, are trying different things, um, right? New York's trying to ban certain certain ingredients and food and all this kind of stuff. Um, so a lot of that new policy stuff is taking place at a city level um, where it's experimented with and at, the, at the state level as well. If you remember correctly, Massachusetts had tried a universal health care system that then became seen as kind of a model for, for Obamacare. So the states and, and feds um, have different powers, and when things can't be done, a lot at a federal level because of separation, the parties are co closely divided, then other parts of the government can um, pass policies, but obviously they're going to be limited to their jurisdiction. Um, so, you know, wherever you're sitting and watching the video, you're under multiple levels of governance, and that's that's the point. You have state state laws, you have federal laws, um, and all kinds of things that impact that. So, most governments in the world are what we call unitary governments, where there's a very strong central government. Um, and so the states, the federal government operates as a federal system at the national level, but the states are uni unitary governments over their cities. So for instance, the state of Iowa has all the power um, as opposed to the city of Sioux City or you know, the city of Sioux Falls is subject to the state of South Dakota. State of South Dakota is a unitary government over the city of Sioux Falls, right? So all the power is up is centralized in the state, and so local governments like the city of Sioux Falls um, or the city of Sioux City, they're creatures of allow the state governments allow them to exist, right? Um, so Iowa could abolish the municipal government of Sioux City. South Dakota could abolish the municipal government of Sioux Falls those kind of things, whereas the federal government could not abolish the state of Iowa or South Dakota and, and those kind of things. So 
a federal system is different than a unitary system. Most of the countries around the world have a unitary system where all the power resides in the central government. A confederation, remember we have the Articles of Confederation, national government is weak and almost all the power is in the, in the states. Right? So the, the Confederacy in the Civil War was a confederation and some of the same issues that happened with the Articles of Confederation happened to the South in the Civil War. You couldn't get Alabama to provide money to Georgia we couldn't get them to really support um, each other. It was kind of like each state was fighting on its own, um, which made it difficult to, to get much done. Um, same things we saw with the Articles of Confederation. Um, and confederations are rare today, right? The UN, NATO, um, those are confederations of, of unions where, again, the states have most of the power. European Union is still in the development without, is it more of a confederation or is it, um, is there strong power in there? And especially with the recent recession, you've seen more, more weakening, I think, with the idea that the, that we're all Europeans, right? It's more that, well, should Germany, um, with its stronger economy, help prop up Greece or make Greece, um, go through a series of policies, um, to bring its financial house into order. And so, um, you know, confederations are, are fairly, fairly rare. And again, federalism decentralizes things. So, um, senators are not, we don't have California people voting on um, senators. We don't all vote on all of the senators, right? We don't all vote on 100 senators. Um, to pick who we want. We vote on the senators from our individual state. So again, that decentralizes it um, because, again, if a faction was able to convince people that, well, you should vote for our party in all of these states, there's still local issues that impact the election of a senator, for instance. Okay. Um, now, with all these different governments, municipal governments, state governments, federal government, there's a, a ton of different layers of government, so then there's more opportunities for people to participate in those governments. You can get into government at multiple levels, right, and participate it, or have, if you're part of an interest group, right, the interest group can impact all these different levels of government. So the interest group can lobby a municipal government, it can lobby a state government, it can lobby the federal government. Um, it can, you can insert yourself either through a group or individually um, into all these different levels of government. So again, this is my point earlier about um, the states are kind of little laboratories of policies. Well, before we try um, to change health care, let's let Massachusetts experiment as a state with how that goes. And we'll see kind of what Massachusetts experience it is with healthcare um, before we try it for the nation, right? Um, let's see how this policy works. Let's see how legalizing marijuana works in Washington and Colorado before we take it to a lot more states, right? Um, now, the states, obviously, they have different populations, smaller populations. You know, some may have a majority of, of higher income workers than other places, or a majority of lower income it may not be truly representative of the nation as a whole. But at the same time, it's it's good to try something out before you bring it to the big time. So here's just a nice chart of some different powers um, under the Constitution that are separated between the states and the feds, and then also some that um, both the state governments and the federal governments have. Um, and so there's different powers granted as the top chart, and then also the ones that are denied, right? Um, so the, the states, because of the problem with currency at the time, do not have the power to coin money. Only the national government has that. Um, you know. A lot of the foreign foreign 
relations kind of powers we don't want Iowa negotiating a second separate treaty with with China um, so a lot of the military force those kind of things um, are given to the federal government or the Constitution um, in the state both the national and the state governments they all, all have the power to tax borrow money establish courts um, those kind of things the charter banks that's an important one and to state governments they can establish local governments the city of Sioux Falls um, regulate commerce um, and then remember the Tenth Amendment everything that the, the Constitution doesn't delegate to the national government um, those powers go to the state <coughs> The ones down here, which are denied, um, you know, violate, you can't violate the Bill of Rights, can't change state boundaries. Um, the one that I found interesting, can't grant titles of nobility, which is obviously a, a, a break from Great Britain. We didn't want, they did that in Great Britain, and we didn't want that to happen. Um, uh, both state and civil rights movements, right, that, that eliminated neither the state nor the the federal government can do that. When we go to talk about civil rights, we learn about, well, it took a while um, after the passing of the 14th and 15th Amendment and 13th Amendment before states were really the imposition of civil rights happened with after Martin Luther King Jr. So why did it take the civil rights amendments for the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment were passed in the Civil War times, right, 1860s, um, and then why did it take so long until the 1960s to um, enforce civil rights through the courts and, and those kind of things. We'll talk more about that in the civil rights area. Um, state governments can't coin money, can't enter treaties, can't tax imports or exports. That's the federal government's job. And so there's some different um, things that the states and governments the state governments cannot do. So again, we talked the last time about the supremacy clause, and that becomes very important in federalism because if the federal government um, can um, win every battle, if the state if the state policy or the state law conflicts with the federal law, then we always have the trump card for if we're in talking about the federal uh, law over the states, okay? Um, so three items are listed um, as the supreme law of the land. The Constitution, laws of the national government, which there are now quite a, many, quite a bit, and treaties. However, the national government can also, can also only operate within its, its sphere and can't take away the powers of the states. Um, other people would point to the Tenth Amendment and say, all right, well, the, the federal government has not been given access to areas of education, right? So we, we can't establish a common core of standards across the country because that's not an area the federal government has traditionally had any authority over. That's always been a state-by-state state authority. But we see a lot more federal government involvement in education now after No Child Left Behind and then now with the Common Core. Um, there's more conflict over whether the federal government has authority versus the state governments who have traditionally had that authority on an individual state basis. So even despite that, um, in battles over who has the authority to make policy, ultimately the winner is going to be the federal government. Okay, And the reason why, um, besides the Constitution, are for key events that have led to the growth uh, of, the, and of the power of the federal government um, as opposed to the states. So the first, the first is the doctrine of implied powers, right? So the necessary and proper clause, the commerce clause, which we talked about, all of those clauses imply that are quite broad, that the Congress has a lot of power and commerce reaches almost everything, or a necessary and proper clause reaches almost everything. Therefore, Congress impliedly has authority to make a lot of law in different areas. Next point, the Commerce Clause, which we have talked about. Um, 
un until those cases that we looked at are already Lopez and um, the Violence Against Women Act, Morrison case, um, until those cases, the Supreme Court had not struck down any congressional action under the Commerce Clause. So you want to regulate mustaches in Wisconsin? Well, mustaches are related to commerce um, because they, the, you know, the barber industry is this much percentage of commerce in Wisconsin and, and you know, we can regulate what, how that impacts and, and mustaches are, you know, in public are, are take away and distractive from commerce, um, all those kind of things. But I think the easiest one is to say that, you know, the barber industry in Wisconsin is part of commerce and we can regulate that because we're Congress and you know, the Commerce Clause. Um, so if you can make such a silly comparison to that about regulating mustaches, think of all the other different ways that Congress can write laws and, and impact things. So the Civil War, um, following the Civil War, right, the federal government consolidated um, its authority much more over all the states, right? No longer were states seen as the ultimate um, source of authority. Because the federal government said, no, we're all going to be part of the country, right? We really are the sole authority as a part of the war and expanding the powers of the federal government to conduct such a large-scale war. The government had gotten much more and much larger, had grown in scale um, in size to conduct the war in terms of purchasing industry men and, and all that kind of railroads, all those things. Um, then led to the, the expansion of the authority of the federal government. The Great Depression, the same thing. We had a New Deal after the, the Great Depression, right? And so the government got much more active in the social safety net and impacting um, things all over the place. And the states wanted that because everyone was hurting in a lot of states. You had a dust bowl in the Midwest. There's no employment in the Northeast or employment really anywhere, right? So. Um, with Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal, he greatly expanded the size of the federal government to try and, and deal with the issues of the Great Depression. And then right after that, we, we had the World War II, obviously, too, did the same thing. The long struggle for racial equality as well. Um, the federal government then, as I said, initially passed in the 1860s and the 1960s, then government had to expand greatly um, to combat and actually enforce the civil rights that were in the civil rights amendments. Um, and so the government had to get involved in desegregating schools and, and the federal government had to grow and enforce a lot of that on the states um, to bring them in compliance. On implied powers, right? Um, McCulloch versus Maryland is the one that's not as famous as Marbury versus Madison, but it's a, a very, very big case in the Supreme Court's history, right? So the Supreme Court ruled that Congress has implied powers under the Necessary and Proper Clause, um, and these necessary policies take precedent over the state policies, okay? Again, this expanded the national government's um, role. So. Um, within the federal government's sphere of action, as John Marshall said, the, go the federal government is, is supreme. So if the federal government goes into an area within its, its sphere of influence, it, it, is, um, it is supreme. And so Congress has implied powers, according to this case, that go beyond just the, the listed powers itself that we looked at just a minute ago. And that was a huge ruling by the Supreme Court. Again, Commerce Clause, right? We talked about that. You can almost find any connection to commerce. Um, you know, Lopez, Morrison, Affordable Care Act have, have scaled back the, the broad reach of the, of, the, of the Commerce Clause. Talked a bit about the Civil War, right? Um, state policies were brought underneath the, the control, voting rights, all those kind of things. 
um, FGR, we talked about the impact on the Great Depression. Full faith and credit, we, we've talked about that before. Um, so full faith and credit, you know, honoring of contracts and that were validly entered in one state um, or policies in one state have to be um, honored in another state. And extradition, if you get arrested in one state, they're going to, you know, Nebraska arrests you, but you have a bunch of charges in Iowa. Nebraska will extradite you into Iowa so that the Iowa criminal system can also deal with you. Um, the Privilege and Immunities Clause um, has never really gone very far. This is another separate clause of the Constitution, which says you have certain rights as a, as a U.S. citizen that are important to you. Um, but there's this famous line of cases following the Civil War called the Slaughterhouse Cases, which sounds like an excellent um, horror movie series that someone should should put together, right? Um, and But in the Slaughterhouse Cases, they basically slaughtered the Privileges and Immunities Clause by saying um, you don't really have these national rights of citizenship because the concern at the time of the slaughterhouse cases was that all these newly released um, former slaves were going to be claiming all kinds of rights. People were still racist back then um, and thought, well, we don't want people claiming all those rights. So um, privilege and immunities clause about federal citizenship, um, you don't get to have you don't get to have those rights. And so that really gutted those, and we haven't really seen that particular clause recover. But certainly in Brown Brood Board of Education, which is another famous civil rights case where segregation was struck down, um, the Civil Civil War amendments and so and to the Constitution, the Thirteenth, Fourteenth, and Fifteenth Amendment um, were then finally used to break kind of the black codes and stuff like that that have been in place since following Reconstruction in the South. Dual federalism. Um, so another way of just kind of visualizing federalism is dual federalism or cooperative federalism. So dual federalism looks at the states and the feds. They have their own spheres, right? We just talked about the supremacy clauses in McCulloch v. Maryland saying, well, the federal government is supreme within its sphere. So it has its sphere of acting and the federal government ha or the state governments have its, have their sphere of acting, right? So dual federalism looks at it as being, you know, each one of them is separate and they have their own separate things. Layer cake federalism um, is often described to um, describe is used to describe dual federalism um, because it's a it's it's a layered cake, right? So if you look at a cake, it's got um, dual each has a separate part of the cake, right? Um, and so dual federalism keeps things separate. Layered cake is a different different layers of the cake. Um, and, you know, Tea Party folks and things like that generally like the idea because they would say federal government don't impact the state government. We want government as small as possible. So in a state government, we want small, limited state government. And the Fed shouldn't come in and, and tell us what to do. Um, each part um, should be separate. Cooperative federalism is a different way of thinking of federalism. This thinks of it as, as more of a um, dual, or not dual, but shared um, sense of responsibility, right? So it's not clean, cut, separate areas of, of authority, right? We kind of, there's certain areas in this, let's take education, for instance. There's certain areas where the federal government wants to be involved in student loans and, and no child left behind, but the state government still set how long you go to school and, and budgets and all that kind of stuff. Um, so you have all these different responsibilities, and it's not clean when you look at the area of education. It's not like state government has this authority in education for K-12 and feds have this. It's kind of this um, intermixed, um, mixed up kind of weaving type of thing. Um, and so the cooperative federalism sees them as much more intertwined and mixed together rather than having a clear separate sphere and marble cake, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute, is the analogy to that where it shows everything kind of intermixed and mingled. It's more of a seen as a partnership. 
And, you know, another area of looking at is like welfare. You have state welfare systems, you have federal welfare systems, and they kind of intermingle together. So here's the different analogies, right? So on the left is layered cake, and this would be dual federalism on the left, the white cake there. Um, as you can see, um, there's separate layers. So dual federalism would say, all right, well, this is the federal government's responsibility. This is the state's responsibility, and so on. On marble cake, for education, it's all mixed in together, right? Here's over the states, but it's not, they're not clean lines as to where the spheres end and start, right? It's kind of an intermixed mixture, and it's much more messy, right? Not clean lines of what, what, what's going on between the two. So for hundreds of programs, cooperative and federalism has shared costs, um, shared administration. So the states will, or the federal government will give the states um, money to run a program, whether it's health care or social security or something like that. And the um, states will end up administrating that according to federal guidelines. As we talked about this um, gridlock at the national level and some of these things allows states and, and cities to experiment on their policies. Fiscal federalism um, is a type of way the federal government can provide grants and money for certain things that they want to see the states do, right? So if you are doing real innovative, race to the top is another education program by the federal government that if your state engages in very innovative, according to the federal policies that are set, if they engage in innovative policies that match the federal guidelines, then the feds will give you more money for that, right? And so there's different grants, you know, construction grants, um, education grants, and it's basically how the federal government incentivizes different states, okay? Grants and aid are one of these things where, um, Federal aid to states um, is, is huge, right? And so um, <laughs> when the federal government gives certain aid to states, that's what the states rely on to implement a lot of those policies. Um, categorical grants are can only be used for really certain specific things that meet um, qualifications set by the government. Um, and so the regulation is the strings tied to that specific category of grants, okay? You can't discriminate. So if you're going to do construction, you have to have um, so many, you know, representative groups also from construction companies. It can't be discriminatory that you're only allowing, you know, white contractors to apply. There has to be a, a variety of people that are, that are applying, right? Obamacare. One of the, the rulings that came out of the Supreme Court case in the Affordable Care Act um, was that states did not have to take the expansion of Medicaid if they didn't want to, even though the Obamacare had said that they, they had to. The Supreme Court said, no, they don't. There's a lot of strings attached to if you accept the federal government's money for running the program, um, how do you work with that? Um, most common type of categorical grant is a project grant. We're going to expand um, the city of Denver, Colorado's um, road system. And, you know, or something that we looked at this, the Obama's higher ed plan and kind of the first session of class regarding student loans. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a specific project, all right? Um, and part of that is look closer at the specific school's value, um, you know, in the Obama higher ed plan. Um, and that's a type of project grant um, that they would look at. Well, Pell Grants, we're only going to grant those um, to colleges that meet those certain standards that we've laid out in the higher ed plan. So fiscal federalism. Um, here's how this is... You know, somewhat dated data, um, but it shows just a pie graph of how spending and, and grants are used for today. So as you can see, healthcare. This is why that's such a big deal. Fifty percent. This is back in 2004, and this this share is only going to keep growing because the baby boomers are getting older, right? And they're 
and they're a huge population number in America. So as the baby boomers get older, this and they need more health care, this, this chunk of the pie is going to get bigger and bigger. Income security is like um, Medicaid, Social Security, welfare kind of things. Education, right? They're suspending on education. Roads and transportation and then all other things amount to 70%. So it just shows you um, how the government, the federal government, helps provide grants to states. And this is the breakdown on how they do that. Formula grants are just the federal government giving grants to states based on the number of people. That's why it's so important to do your census um, for the area where you live, because the more people that live there, the more money you get um, for certain things, right? Um, block grants are like community development and social services, and they provide more flexibility as opposed to categorical grants. Um, on how to spend money, right? So the local communities have a greater autonomy on how to spend it rather than um, the federal government. Um, and one of this, that was one of the major innovations of welfare um, was returning more kind of state authority over welfare and um, letting states run welfare programs more under block grants rather than um, more control from the federal government. The last type of things, mandates, right? So these are federal laws and rules without any funding. So No Child Left Behind is the famous one, which is where schools have to get better or else. But oh, by the way, we're not, as the federal government, we're not going to provide you with any additional funds or budget to accomplish those goals. Um, so that's a mandate. The IRS is, is mandated in charge, in charge of. Um, enforcing the Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. So if you don't get it, have medical insurance and you don't list that on your tax return, um, the IRS is going to fine you. And therefore, um, you know, again, the federal government didn't give the IRS any extra money or people to do that. And so mandates are kind of unfund unfunded um, requirements that the federal government's put on the states. The number of governments, right? So here's all the different types of governments that, that we have. We have obviously one federal government, 50 state governments. There's all the county governments, the city governments, townships, school districts, special districts. Um, and so there's the, just a huge number of governments in America, right? It's, that's the different levels of federalism. I can plug in at all those different levels and the separation of power between all of those different governments. Um, as you can see, um, ensures that there's no one government that, one faction that should be able to control our government. So, uh, one famous political science e, political scientist E. e. Schatzneider wrote a book called The Semi-Sovereign People, and he said that government needs to grow and expand its its size and power um, to keep up with business to preserve the common interest. And so the one question would be, do you agree with that, that government should grow to um, provide a check on business? And then the second question is, is there really a common interest that we can highlight? Um, or are Americans too diverse and their opinions too diverse that for us ever really say the American people believe this or there is a common interest of this? Can you think of anything that would, would be a common interest?